Amy and Kirby, you guys have made films about like rape and assault in the military, and I don't feel like that was as noisy as the, <laughs> is it, or like or, or as, as contested. Is it? Pentagon's is it, a uh, pussy cat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know there's been a lot of discussion about the distribution and the departure of Oprah, and now finally the film is premiered. So I just wonder how it feels today versus weeks and weeks of this madness and how you're processing it. I mean, for me, my anxiety level has dropped tremendously. Um, it was, it was mind blowing and very disorienting um, and scary. It was really scary, but being there last night. Um, seeing the response from the audience, which I didn't expect. And just because there had been so much mm -hmm. noise mm -hmm. um, and deflection from the real issue and the topic of sexual assault perpetrated by Russell Simmons and the impact that that has and the erasure of black women's stories in the Me Too movement was completely lost. And so, um, re taking a look at the reviews and just feeling a tremendous amount of love, mm -hmm. you know, and support has made all the difference. Yeah. My anxiety level is like at nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help but wonder, you know, it feels, and the film does such a great job of discussing the specific burden of women of color in, in the Me Too movement, and also how music really has been untouched, which is mm -hmm. sort of wild. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't help but wonder if we would be mitigating a movie full of white women the same way. Like, mm -hmm. for instance, the actress accuses of Harvey Weinstein or anything like that. It feels, uh, I think, Drew, you said it best, it feels like another assault. And it's just very disappointing. <laughs> yeah, well, I, in some ways I feel that what's happening with the film and it's th this sort of difficult path it's finding even in the home stretch to just see the light of day is sort of like a meta example of what the whole conversation of the film is yeah. about. Um, but I wanted to say something also about how I feel. Um, you know, I've been on this journey as we all have really for about two years, mm -hmm. you know, we're a year and a half to two years out, mm -hmm. um, Sherry and I both broke our silence the very same day. I was in the New York Times, she was in the LA Times, and Sly would have been ahead of us, <laughs> um, but she ended up being six months later. Um, and so we're, we've been at this really for about two years, the silence breaking thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up in the documentary even before I decided to break my silence. Um, so I feel like I've been like this patient on the operating table for two years you know, just like completely wound open. And just when I thought they were gonna close up the patient, like the hospital collapsed around me. <laughs> and, you know, it was the most terrifying experience. Really, like I still haven't processed that trauma because I just wanted to get through Sundance, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. And I feel last night, just having seen the film Mm -hmm. in a theater, mm -hmm. having it warmly received. Thank God. I feel like the patient is now closed up and I can be sort of sent home from the hospital, you know. And um, that feeling of sort of being suspended for so long and um, this sort of hairpin turn at the end, it's been really, really hard. Like honestly, a trauma in and of itself that I think we're probably all gonna be unpacking for a while. Mm -hmm. But we're on the other side of that, and hopefully the film will find an audience and really the purpose of all of this, because we'd all broken our silence already, was to really expand the conversation beyond ourselves mm -hmm. and have a conversation about black women more broadly and how we've been lost in this conversation not just in the Me Too movement, but sort of in America. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm hopeful that, you know, I feel like I can see a light at the end of the tunnel, really. And that's a relief. Thank God for that. You okay, Sherry? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm lear I've learned to just uh, 
not let anxiety get the best of me. And then, to be honest with you, I was so excited about this coming out. I was so excited that, wow, this is a chance that our voice is gonna be heard. We're not gonna be silent. You didn't back us down. And then when that blow came, it was bad that it was on my, my birthday, around my birthday, and Aww. I was like, huh? You know, but I didn't know how to take it. It, it felt like something hit your chest and then, but you're like, and then um, I didn't know how, what to think or what to film. I'm like, I just said, okay. I just said, you know what? I'm spiritual, I'm not religious. And I just said, you know what, God? It's the way you want it to happen. I don't never idolize nobody. Nobody's my God. You're my God. It's, you, it's in your hands, so whatever way it happened, it's gonna happen. And that helped me get rid of my anxiety. That helped me to say, you know what? It's making me stronger, actually. And we're still gonna tell us. It doesn't matter. The story is the story. Like, you can't silence us. What, one of the more devastating um, parts of this film for me, and I think it was um, Kirna who said it, is that uh, your sort of erasure and disappearance in the music industry has deprived the culture of potentially 20 years of music um, and your talent. And I wonder, where do you think you would be today if you had stayed the course? What role, what companies? What, I just, I, I can only imagine how far you would have climbed. I almost try not to think about that because it's so painful. I mean, that's, you know, there, there are many crimes, right? And there's the rape. I bounced back from that. I found Clive. I had a good run. I thought I was free and clear. The loss of really something that I loved so much and I loved to do, and I accumulated this expertise, like from answering phones all the way up to, you know, being a VP and a Grammy voter and all that good stuff. You know, that's been huge. You know, that's hard. You know, I, you know, your 20s are kind of the years that you kind of build the expertise, build the credibility, build the relationships. You know, I had kids in my 30s. That's a much harder time in your life to reinvent yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, it would have been nice if I'd had some traction already. But that was, you know, I, I like analogies. And I, I kind of <laughs> felt like my, my career was like this game board. And like 90% of it was grayed out and unplayable. And so then I tried to play. My, I went to business school and thought, can I build a career for myself in this 10% of the board? And what I have found after saying Me Too and Ella, the young woman in the film, finding me through her mom, suddenly the whole board became, became playable again. Now, the last 15 days, I started to wonder, OK, is this board graying out again? But um, you know, what I'd intended was to start in music, because that's kind of my first language and my first love. You know, I worked in independent films. Back, you know, sort of when I was also, you know, in the music industry and I had this grand vision of starting in music and then writing. I wrote some screenplays. I, you know, had some, you know, shortlisted screenplays and festivals and stuff like that. And I thought I would, you know, honestly, I really kind of modeled myself on like an Oprah. I wanted to be like a multimedia person, you know, where I started in music and I did film and television and a little bit of activism sort of you know, sort of informing my work. And, you know, I, that was the vision. I mean, I really wanted to grow up and be kind of like a Oprah kind of person. And so, you know, we'll never know. Um, but, you know, hopefully I can still make a dent. And um, so, you know, it is what it is. Uh, so for the three of you, I think that um, it's so painful to, and, and interesting, if that's appropriate to say, to, to listen to sort of a discussion about, um, I believe, as one of the experts put it, how women of color sort of build their own tombstones and sacrifice personal safety um, in service of a larger racial quest to not subject black men to the American criminal justice system. And it's just infuriating to process <laughs> as someone who has probably no business being infuriated by it. But, but I just wonder if you could talk about why you think that conversation conversation is so suppressed and why this specific burden on, on you guys as women of color and also the, the light privilege I think is really interesting as well. Well, I mean, I could, I, I, from somebody that grew up in um, the Bronx in the community, um, it was, we all was from the Bronx and we all, women had a habit of holding up the neighborhood, which was 
It could have been your brother. That was a drug dealer. It could have been that. that. It was just a, a hold up. We held each other up because we was all we had in the hood. Yeah. Um, I work, actually now I work in the criminal system and I work with inmates and um, it's interesting and um, I, I talk to them, but as far as that, the way I look at it is that when somebody tell me about, um, well, you know, how do you feel that somebody's, you know, bringing down the black men? And I, and I just thought about that and I um, answered the question the best way I could. I said, well, how is it that me of a woman of color that did nothing but held up my, community of black men, whether they was anything they did, my brothers, anything held them up and always had their back and support. And then somebody turned around that I held up. And when I say held up, I held up another black man as far as, you know, our rush was like the man we was like, oh, and my, we trusted him and my mother trusted him with our music to violate me. How do you think I feel? And that's a burden and it's like, I don't get this where we of color and women of color, we, you know, we have to be silent and whatever happens. And I've seen things growing up and from a strong mom that was raising 11 kids that she just let things happen. And you just shut up and didn't have to say nothing, but you always was holding up Can your I say community. Well, yeah, okay. I wanted to jump in. Okay, mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I just want to jump in. Um, I mean, when you talk about historically, the way that we as a people have been able to push back and fight against white supremacy and um, colonialism, imperialism, shadow slavery. It was through the bonds, the unity of our race. And that has driven us through various social movements and advancements, um, you know, from the time of the, from the beginning of this country. And so we're indoctrinated into race first. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and it has saved us. Mm -hmm. It has. However, um, we do live in a patriarchal society that is heavily misogynistic and tremendous amount of rape culture, which is normalized. Mm -hmm. And that impacts people from all walks of life, all genders, all races, and 90% of sexual assaults are intraracial. And when you look at the statistics about what happens, you know, recently um, a story came out about how 85% of black girls, by the time they're 18, have experienced some type of sexual abuse um, or assault. And it's rampant. And the people who are doing this to us are our men. Now, I'm not saying that black men are inherently bad. What I am saying is that there are men who are serial predators, who ultimately are able to continue to attack and to con and continue their predatory behavior mm -hmm. because we feel such an absolute conviction that one, we do not want to be responsible for putting a black man into prison. And then two, going against the code of our race and our culture and community. I really want to say something. Mm -hmm. Three years ago, George Zimmerman was acquitted of killing Trayvon Martin because the jury believed that he was capable of using the sidewalk as a lethal weapon, okay? So this is not theoretical. Mm -hmm. There is a mythology right now in America that black men and boys are dangerous. Mm -hmm. So when we speak out about a really, truly dangerous black man, mm -hmm. and that becomes a headline, Trayvon Martin is more vulnerable, okay? Tamir Rice is more vulnerable. Michael Brown is more vulnerable because we are sort of, we live at, in a plane that's below the mainstream. So the stories that trickle up to a white audience are very limited, right? 
So we are managing those stories and the choices that we make as black people, understanding that we are communicating information to you guys that we can't control. Mm -hmm. And so if we create a headline, and we know it's gonna be a headline that Russell Simmons is a violent rapist, then my own son is now more dangerous. You know, my own father, my own cousins, you know what I'm saying? They are literally and truly more dangerous. It's not theoretical. They truly believed. The lawyer held up a piece of sidewalk and said that he, Trayvon Martin, used it as a lethal weapon. George Zimmerman had a gun and he was acquitted. This mythology is real. It's powerful. It makes a difference. People are dying because of it. So it's not just some sort of like team black people go race. Mm -hmm. I know that if I speak out, some boy, some man could be racially profiled and die in an altercation with the police. And that police officer will be acquitted because somebody saw a headline about Russell Simmons and they think we all look alike. So, I mean, it's very, very real. I can't, and, I'll, and manifest as a, an incredibly toxic burden on this specific sect of that community, which seems incredibly unfair. So can I ask, like, f f from your own uh, just pain and, and, and the impossibility of the situation, is there a salve? Where does the burden have to go? Like, who has to take the charge to, to not only relieve you guys of that? We have to have nuanced conversations. That's why independent film matters. That's why rigorous journalism matters. This is a nuanced conversation. It's not a sound bite. That's why I'm so grateful to Amy and Kirby. Because we have to begin to have a nuanced conversation. And be, because it's a nuanced dynamic. And I think that's the only hope that we have. And we need people who are not black, who are not in our community to listen. And we need as a community to not be defensive. And I understand why we're defensive. Of course we are. But we have to breathe and we have to talk about it and we have to listen and we have to be patient so that we can evolve. Yes. But I, can, I just please. wanted to jump in really quick please, because please, I was just like, yeah. like, my palms are sweating and I'm just like, go Drew, yes, yes, <laughs> preach, preach, preach. Um, Open the but, window, <laughs> get a speaker. <laughs> I know, where's the choir? Um, the tambourine. Um, so, no, but, but also, we, going off what you're talking about, when, we're, when you're talking about Michael Brown and Trayvon and the, say her name was Correct. created because people don't remember yes. the black women victims of police violence. So it's indoctrinated regardless in our own community. Unfortunately, That's right. we prioritize black men and protect them because that has been our role. Right. We have to shield our sons. We have those talks with our kids. Mm -hmm. Don't walk this way. Don't talk this way. If you encounter a cop, this is how Don't you move behave. Your hands. Don't move your hands. <laughs> and it still doesn't save your life. But when it comes to us within this movement, I think it goes beyond nuanced conversations. One of the things that has to happen is that black men need to confront their own behavior and the way in which they shield each other. Change is not going to occur because a Russell Simmons wakes up one day and says, you know what, I was wrong, I'm sorry. I'm going into intensive therapy and I'm acknowledging the harm that I've done or any other rapist. That's not it. The onus is on nonviolent men to take a stand Men who are bystanders, mm -hmm. but for whatever reason, such as what we're talking about, choose to prioritize their gender over the safety of our community. Right. Because it's not just women who are being assaulted. Africa Mambada was assaulting boys. Mm -hmm. And so, it's not a conversation. We are talking about a cultural shift that needs to initiate within black men, men in general, because the truth of the matter is predators have very little chance of any redemption. Mm -hmm. Where we have an opportunity to change 
is when men stand up. Because we have been carrying this burden for far too long. And what has the result been? We are ostracized. We are blamed. We are held accountable. And that is not my burden. I, didn't, I did not enable Russell Simmons because I didn't file a police report. I protected myself because if I had spoke up, I would have been destroyed. Russell is the only person responsible mm -hmm. for his behavior. We have, I can speak for myself, I stayed silent to save my life. Mm. And that is not a burden that yeah. myself or any of us or any survivor should have to carry. I stayed silent, silent to save my career. I mean, I did. I stayed silent because I was, <laughs> I was playing in the, you know, going in the league of the, all females going after the guys, and we used to rap, and I know Russell was powerful, and here we are women, you know, battling guys, and I said, they would have been like, in the hood, like, n me blowing Russell up, first of all, nobody would have believed me. Mm -hmm. They would have been like, oh, Sherry, come on. You gonna do this to Rush, because that's the hood, you know, this is Uncle Russell, he's putting hip hop on. So I stayed silent, because I was like, I, I didn't think my word at the moment, and at that time, or myself was important enough to, and it was like, who's gonna believe this? So crazy. So like, you make a really good point about listening, and I wonder if you guys find it duplicitous that people like L.A. Reid and Russell will say that they understand the sensitivity at the moment, but they deny it, and then exert their incredible influence to pressure people as powerful as Oprah to kill your stories. That is a playbook. Mm -hmm. That is a playbook move. Let's be, let's be very clear. Even if Yogini Simmons were to actually do what I said, right? Because when you're talking about the concept of restorative justice or transformative justice, the first thing that needs to happen is a perpetrator needs to admit they're wrong. And the harm not only that they did to the individual, but to the community, to their families, and to society at large. Russell or L.A. Reid will never admit what they've done because to do so would open them up to lawsuits. At a minimum. At a minimum. And then also incarceration. So. And their pride and who they are because they looked up as idols. So there's no way they're going to come out and say, I did that because everybody looks to them as their gods. Uncle Rush, no, what Uncle Rush gonna do this? How dare you say that? It's just that, you know, so of course they're not gonna say nothing because it's gonna, it's what she said and it's also I think is that they don't want their, their, their name tarnished. I'll just like, say that, you know, it's like. Russell overpowered all three of us physically once mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. and he is overpowering us again. Mm -hmm. He overpowered us, but even back then, economically, socially, the power dynamic was completely off balance. There was no way we could stand up. And he targeted us. He knew who to go after. So as far as any redemption is, is possible with them, I'm sorry. I throw it away. I have zero hope. That's me. The focus is on believing survivors. The focus is on supporting films such as this one, which center our voices. Because to my knowledge, I don't know of any other film which delves into the Me Too movement or sexual violence in a way that really foregrounds our voices. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful for that mm -hmm. because it has been hell screaming into the wind and having everybody Ignore what I have to say. This is not, from my opinion, when I looked at this, and I really took all these years suppressing this and feeling stupid, this is how I, not literally stupid, but this is how I feel. Um, I really learned now that this is not about Russell. This is about what he did to me. And for me, this is a cleansing. <laughs>